because I know that my students in the graduate course saw the video with Erki's retrospective, right? Is that was your assignment. Okay, so I had something to say. And those of you who haven't, yeah. if you go online, you can actually yeah. see Erki's talk from the past. What is when that? He really goes through his whole chronology, and it's quite an interesting path. I definitely recommend you to take a look. Today he will talk about his process. So it's very much about work in progress. And for those of you that are not aware of this, Erki is actually in charge of our critical and theoretical aspect in the department. He leads our graduate students in the writing process because they're all required to, in addition to doing an artwork, also write a significant paper of research that inform that artwork. One of the uh, contributions so that Erki has made to the field of theory and critical studies is this term media archaeology. This is actually starting to be taught in other departments and be used as a terminology, but it's actually coined by Erki, and he's the first one that actually started thinking of digging deeper into media art theory specifically to look beyond the surface kind of hoopla of computers and technology and look at old technology and old ideas of interactivity that actually inform what's going on today. So give a warm welcome to Erki and we'll see what he's doing now. All right. <clears throat> okay, so thank you Victoria for these uh, kind words. Um, I should probably say that I would rather say that I was one of, one of the first to start using this, uh, this word. So there were some others also fairly early on, like Siegfried Zielinski, who uh, started developing that idea. But what I think it is important is that <coughs> important to remember or state that this, um, I call media archaeology or archaeology of media an approach. It's not, not yet a discipline, even though courses have been taught now very recently in some universities. For instance, uh, Wendy Ying Chai, so she is teaching right now at Brown University, a course on media archaeology, and, um, and a professor and artist uh, named Paul De Marinis in uh, Stanford University has taught media archaeology. I have been visiting, actually talking to Paul's students within this framework. So, it is still very much an emerging approach, and that, that means that uh, everybody on this field basically should define it for oneself. And that's one of the reasons why I chose to uh, talk about uh, the archaeology of media from my own perspective for you today, so that you will understand um, where I stand in relation to this concept. And um, I will show you also quite a few examples about how I feel this uh, idea could be usefully applied <coughs> to the deeper understanding of media culture and also the media arts. Um, so I have actually um, published in recent years a few studies uh, sort of like taking these theoretical ideas and trying to apply that to a certain field. And, uh, and this um, talk, um, deliberately, will cross over some of those interests. So uh, just to mention to you very briefly, so I've been very interested in the notion and idea about interactivity, you know, as, as you know, it manifested in uh, phenomena like interactive media, interactive art, interactive design, and so and um, I've been very curious to, s to try to see whether we can actually trace it in culture much further back than the uh, emergence of uh, digital media, which happened only about sort of like since the 1940s with the, with the first digital computers. So I've taken that quite, quite a bit further back in time. And that is an on ongoing book project, which I call Archaeologies of Interactivity. I've been working on that for quite a long time. I've been also uh, looking at the notion of the screen uh, from the media archaeological point of view. So 
What's interesting for me is really that, you know, like we are so surrounded by certain kinds of techno technological objects that we rarely ask these questions, you know, that the fact that we are spending so much of our times sitting in front of these screens seems something like really self-evident. And I'm just trying to ask basically simple but difficult questions. Well, is, th is this really so self-evident that such a great part of our lives is spent staring at this kind of thing, face to face, a certain kind of surface, opening up ways to get somewhere, probably a virtual re realm or something like that. And, um, and one of the points I've made is that we have to go much further back in time, once again, than any sort of like technologically defined screens to understand how that, that kind of situation came to be in culture. Um, another topic, um, I'm just going to publish a very long study about that actually in a few months time is what I call peep media. So which means that I, I've been looking at uh, this notion and idea about peeping at images, often peeping at moving images uh, across several centuries and trying to understand whether we can actually trace any kinds of continuities from there. So that kind of thing, so, but um, before I will actually um, also show you a few examples, uh, which are sort of like kind of moments in this research. So I would actually um, like to start by showing a few images and then uh, showing, you, showing you a few, few slides about media archeology, span uh, certain definitions, certain basic concepts, the way I understand those. And once more, these are not shared fully by other researchers. So it, it's a field which is, which is uh, just trying to look for, find its forms. This, so this is my interpretation of media archeology. span So, okay, my life practice, um, I remember I've been asked these questions over the years, you know, okay, you do something at the university, but what, what do you do in your spare time? What are your hobbies? You know, that kind of things. And, and quite simply, since I was a very young person, I have absolutely no way of answering these questions because there's no real uh, division between my hobbies and my work. All my spare time is my work and all my work is my spare time. So I enjoy what I'm doing and I'm glad to be in such a position. So let's say I read papers, I read magazines, newspapers, and, and uh, I have huge, huge piles of things that I actually found wherever I happen to be, on a bus, on a plane, something like that. All of a sudden these pictures start speaking to me. This is something I found like two years ago. As you can see, it's an, it's an ad for, uh, for an SUV. And an SUV which, this, which has this uh, <coughs> embedded uh, AV system. Uh, and um, I think that the thing that actually caught my attention here was basically this sort of like the layout and the message of the, of the poster. So, so you, say, you say kids on board, kids not bored. And then you see these kids actually playing games with this AV system here. What I found interesting in this thing is actually the relationship between the SUV, its large windows, and the beautiful, beautiful uh, landscape that it seems to be traveling through. And this quite striking contrast that while, while we have this beautiful, amazing landscape, these kids are just sort of like mesmerized by those screens. So there are two kinds of screens in a way. The screens of the, of the SUV itself and these technical screens inside the SUV. And I think that there is a, some interesting issue at stake here. How did we get to this point that we are praising a situation where we have this, this possibility of going to places we could never reach by walking, and at the same time we don't even have a look at them? I was um, traveling to Europe in August and um, reading the Delta Airlines Sky magazine, and I saw this picture. It's uh, an ad for the new Vio computer with Wi-Fi connection. Once again, what I find striking is, in some sense, a variation of this formula I think I found in the previous one. So look at this guy. He's in this most amazing landscape. He's boating and there's others. 
what is he doing? He has stopped, and the, the thing he's looking at is the screen. So without paying any attention, it makes it's a kind of a, like a somehow I think an absurd idea. So why this? Why did he really have to have this Wi-Fi and go to that place if the only thing he wanted to do is to stare at the screen of the wire? Well, of course, I mean that this this serves the uh, purpose of the um, manufacturer of this um, device. It is a it is an advertising discourse. And of course, as you, as you all know, advertising discourses try to show their product from a very positive angle. But I mean that one of the um, tasks, I think, for a media archaeologist is to try to go beyond these things, to a sort of like a quick semiotics of these, these kind of representations and try to see, well, is the essential thing here, here really the thing that so let's say wire here tries to, so Sony tries to convince and Singular try to convince us to do which is this wireless beyond hotspot at last or is it probably something else that is actually embedded on a little bit deeper level in this, this kind of messages and that's what I find interesting because we found cultural figures like this this is of course a picture of an early radio amateur this picture is from from the 19 so from the teens so about 100 years ago which was quite interesting because it represented not just the appearance of a new kind of a figure in uh, first in, in western culture but it also uh, uh, represented the appearance of a highly interesting discourse discourse which was sort of like redefining media culture as it was happening at the point, at that point. So we had this figure that was associated with these machines, devices that, that didn't have to do with screens, but you know, we had to do with an intense sort of like concentration in this case through the, through the earphones and uh, devices that were often constructed at least partly by these people themselves, a kind of a, like a young boy Boy, boy inventor, boy genius. And um, so these kind of characters often became sort of like front page news at that time. Like New York Times would write these people. So in a way, the, the Thomas Edison of our time is this boy who's sitting in the, in the attic and building his devices and using this device to discover new realms, new invisible worlds, which were the worlds of the ether full of dots and dashes and noises and sounds. So these people were seen as some kind of explorers at the time. I'm not, not going to go into this discussion right here, so talk, talk about this whole discourse, but, but what I find interesting is that, that there was a controversy. I mean, there were, there were, there were discourses that were highly praising that kind of figures, but there were also, also uh, other kind of discourses that really attacked the kind of phenomenon that this, um, these uh, radio amateurs represented. So first of all, they were deemed as hackers who were sending, uh, let's say, US, US Navy boats on ghost missions. That happened a few times. So they could actually, they could crack the Morse codes used by the, by the US Navy and they sent war boats out on the sea. And then was sort of like the, the, the admiral started wondering, well, do you actually know, what are we actually doing here? Well, I don't know. I don't have the slightest idea. And then they found out that it was just a kind of a, a hack that had sent them on the, on the seas. The other thing was, of course, this issue about mental health. There was a very important, very famous case where uh, a father, uh, contacted the U.S. authorities in the um, asking them to revoke the radio amateur's license that they had given for his son because he felt that his son is dying, you know. He has locked himself into the attic. He never even talks to us anymore. He doesn't eat. He's dying, you know. He's fading away in the attic. So please, please, revoke his license. I want my son back. Sounds familiar, I guess. So, we have these discourses that 
in a way, I wouldn't say I've repeated exactly, but contain features that seem to be sort of like coming back in different cultural contexts. And I, have, don't ha I don't think I have to mention the word internet in this context to make it understandable. And this is, um, this is an image that has become a kind of a key, key image for my approach for media archaeology and, um, and I keep on showing it just simply because, because of the meaning. Uh, this was something I found in the early 90s when I was just in the, you know, beginning this kind of, developed this kind of an, so to say, pulling these ideas together little by little. And um, this is, a, uh, as you can see, it's a, it's a cartoon which was published in, in, uh, in 1911. It's not the later famous Life magazine, but another, which was just a like comic, like an American uh, version of The Punch, the famous British comic uh, uh, journal. And um, what, it, what it shows is a sort of like, um, of course, it is a sort of like prophecy. It's a, it's, a, it's a futuristic vision about the way how these new, all these new, new communication machines are going to change our lives. And uh, what I found interesting is, of course, this sort of like highly dystopian or negative vision here. So ironic, ironically titled, we'll all be happy then, happy then. So showing just this elderly man surrounded by all these interesting, fanciful, imaginary gadgets. So this is a total, a, a total multi, multi-sensory environment that he's surrounded with because media in this vision don't only uh, sort of like uh, include things that are sort of like close to broadcasting. So the broadcasting, uh, radio broadcasting hadn't been started yet. So it happened like 10 years, a little bit later. But anyway, news services here or opera to the other ear. Um, interesting sort of like devices like here, this observiscope, which is a kind of a personalized surveillance device. So where there's a menu, a preset menu, and through this menu, he can sort of like activate remote cameras. Uh, one of them here shows his son and the, the, his, uh, the girlfriend of his son and seen behind their backs. So the idea about sort of like surveillance is, is, is very much in this, this uh, vision. We also have the idea about the ocean and mountain breeze company provo providing breezes to the home, plus, of course, the, the metropolitan sunlight storage company providing, providing light, things like that. So what I found striking is, is, the, is the way how the, the, the social unit has di disappeared. So we have only one human present in this space and these robot servants and then other humans either just here as names like the, the family. Family is something that you can reach through a push button on a, on a menu or and, and visualize on a, on a screen. And um, so what, what I was interested in at that, that point is really that that was the time when everybody was reading these um, apocaly apocalyptic, apocalyptic uh, postmodern uh, French thinkers like Jean Baudrillard. That was like a big thing in the 1980s. And um, Baudrillard spent much time in his, in his books writing about this sort of like alienating effects of this media that's kind of turning into a sort of like a cocoon or, or a satellite or, a, or a, some kind of a media sphere surrounding us. And he, and he saw it sort of like really having very deep uh, effects on the sort of like social units in life. And um, so what, what I said, well, okay, here you have the Baudrillardian argument in all its essential features as a cartoon, and this was 1911. Uh, w what was interesting is that Baudrillard spoke about media in his own time, so how he saw this happening under the postmodern condition. While here we obviously operated in a much, much earlier stage in the development of media culture, situation where many of these devices were still fan just fancy, you know, fant fantasies, uh, what, what I have called uh, discursive inventions. But the, the certain kind of attitudes 
uh, crystallized in, in this course can be clearly identified from this thing here. And uh, surely it was something that Baudrillard never saw, never thought about himself. That was a moment that really um, sort of like made me think about things that don't seem to happen in a linear fashion, but rather through some kind of cycles within media culture. So the, I got interested in the way how certain ideas, often cliched ideas, banal ideas, ideas that seem to be invisible because they are so familiar, are repeated over and over again and giving new interpretations in new contexts. So I, was, I started asking questions just simply, what are these ideas? Why are they repeated? How, how are they transmitted within culture? So these kind of ideas became some of the groundwork for this sort of like media archaeological approach. So I'm just going to present you a few of the premises of this thing, media archaeology. So this is some, some premises, and then I will show some theoretical principles, and then I will uh, focus on this uh, central concept of topos after a while. And um, once we are through, once, once, once we are through that, I will, I'm not trying to convince anybody, but I will try to show you how these things can be fruitfully applied to media cultural material. And in the end, how that can also contribute to a better understanding of media culture as it is happening right now. So, first of all, um, I don't believe that media ever exists independently of the cultural frameworks that envelop them. So, we could even say it in a more sort of like pointed way by, by uh, saying that media specificity is in the end cultural specificity. But I put a question mark in the end because this is a point of debate. Because there are many, many um, thinkers uh, from uh, Marshall McLuhan in the 1960s to somebody like Friedrich Kittler uh, in our times, who seem to be saying that the media specific specificity is the key, that media are in a way unique and specific things that affect culture, change culture. So the, you remember the, probably the famous slogan uh, by Marshall McLuhan, media, the medium is the message. I mean, there are many ways of reading that. So he was the uh, rather obscure thinker in many ways. But one way is to say that medium is the message, is that medium is the sort of like decisive factor, factor in culture. Medium affects the culture. We might even say that the appearance of a medium leads to certain kind of ruptures in culture, changes, transformations, things like that. that. So that is a school of thinking that I believe often leans towards this, what was often known as technological determinism, saying that the technology itself determines some, some changes and phenomena in culture. And even though there are cases in which it is definitely quite correct in some, some ways, um, I guess I mostly belong to the, I, shall we say, I belong closer to the opposite camp, which is the camp of sort of like, cultural studies, where the idea is that media, when they are invented, when they are developed, when they are adapted, always uh, are born in a, in a pre-existing cultural situation, and they cannot uh, escape those meanings, those attitudes, those, those ideas, in the end, those discourses that pre-exist them. Of course, on the other hand, a media, when it find, medium, when it finds its place in, 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 in society, has an impact. But that, that cannot have an, happen without previously being in, in, impacted itself by things already existing in, in society. And as I also mentioned, uh, in this kind of um, media archaeology, the attention 
um, I think the main attention is on the discursive side of culture. This means that all the attitudes, feelings, fears, hopes, we attach to material things, and which I think affects deeply the way how we use them, how they, we define them, how we develop them, and, and so on. So I, I would claim that the material does not exist outside of the discursive. In my particular case, this has been much influenced my early sort of like, so we say, we say semiotic bath. Uh, my involvement with semiotics, uh, the, sign, uh, the, the science of science, uh, reading culture in terms of signs that are basically always coded. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that here, but that affected much my thinking when I was a young student. Uh, an idea I always repeat as well, which had a deep impact on me, uh, comes from Raymond Williams, a very famous British uh, cultural and literary scholar. Um, one of the sort of like founding figures, I would say, of cultural studies uh, in many ways, is that is this distinction made between, uh, it's, it's a theoretical distinction, made between media technology and cultural form, saying that media technology is something, let's say, we can think about, for instance, uh, let's say, video, video camera and all its accessories and things like that. It does certain kinds of things. It shoots, shoots image, images in real time, but it also records those images and so on. But I, I believe, like, like Raymond Williams, that media technology really gets its meanings when it's turned into cultural forms. And I think that this always happens if something is ad adapted. Why is this important? It is important because if we focus merely on the media technology, we easily get back, back to this idea about cultural determinism. Um, if we think about devices like, um, okay, like a broadcasting institution like television, KTLA or whatever, so it, uh, it, rep it um, represents a certain way of using a certain technology. So the broadcasting institution uses uh, what's sometimes known as television technology, sometimes known as video technology. There are different uses for that in a certain way, as you all know, sending programs every night to the homes and, and so. But I mean that if we look at these things like Raymond Williams, uh, so we might say that that technology that KTLA uses the technology itself, that media technology, does not determine necessarily the, its use in, uh, in, in broadcasting. So there is no necessary link between that technology and, uh, and, and its use in broadcasting. I will show you an example later, but, but let me just point out that, that this technology, whether we call it television technology or video technology or something, has been used for many different purposes. And, and broadcasting is very, very visible, it's very important, but it's not the only one. So that means that those meanings and the, the way it, is, it becomes a medium are determined within, are, are negotiated within a sort of like a cultural context. And, uh, and the technology itself doesn't say what it is going to become. Finally, Another very important influence for me from early, early years on was Walter Benjamin. Uh, a, another uh, important literature and cultural scholar who died in 1940. Uh, you probably, you may have heard about his tragic uh, death on the border between France and uh, Spain. He was um, a Jewish scholar and he was escaping the Nazis and he wasn't allowed to cross the border, and in desperation he killed himself in, the, in a kind of inn on the, on the French-Spanish uh, border. Luckily his writings survived, except probably one manuscript he, which he may have carried with him in, the, in his suitcase that has disappeared. Anyway, what Benjamin said, one of, his, one of his important ideas was about what he called the dream worlds of culture. And this means those which we would maybe now call discursive worlds of culture. 
culture in, this, in the disc discursive dimension. And just em emphasizing how, that these things are equally important than the, and, and equally real than the material ones. This was a very important and actually uh, uh, observation that he defended with his writings in, in those years was something that was not taken as granted. And uh, maybe there are still people who don't, don't do it, but I surely find these dream worlds equally interesting and important. And in that sense, I guess my work follows the kind of work that Walter Benjamin and people like Wolfgang Schivelbusch and others have, have been doing. Okay, so here are now some of the some of the characteristics for media archaeology, the way I understand it. First of all, what I think, what it does is it, it excavates secret, forgotten, neglected, uh, and suppressed histories. This means that that history is seen as a sort of like a multi-layered, also the history of media, multi-layered construct. And uh, there are layers that have just disappeared from our memory. There's a huge amount of material, and we, we actually usually deal with a very, very little amount of that. And I think media archaeology has to take all that material, in the ideal case, into account and try to understand, try to draw conclusions, uh, try to uh, see what we can do, how we can change our notion of history based on those. Because uh, our understanding of history, and even media history, it's often based on certain dominant historical narratives. So certain versions of history become very, very important, and I think that it's very important to uh, remember that these are not necessarily the, the only histories that exist, not the only possible ones. In the, our field, uh, a phenomenon that uh, is, is quite interesting and important is the so-called corporate crypto history. This means uh, histories commissioned by uh, corporations, you know, the corp corporate histories of Microsoft or IBM and uh, Kodak and uh, just name it. There is a whole group of historians who do this kind of work. They are often independent historians who make their living by writing these kind of histories. But surely these histories don't usually show the company from in a negative light, as you can imagine. So it is one form of history that may affect our notion and consciousness about the, uh, the way media culture has developed. I will show you one example later. Okay, I think that media archaeology is very much non-deterministic. So um, it does not look at, you know, history from the point of view of what came to be, you know, for instance, in the present. Rather, it is interesting to try to sort of like leap back to the history to a certain moment and look at the ways how people understood certain things uh, starting from that point. Because that's often very different from the way how we sort of like now standing on the shoulders of our ancestors look at those things. So we need to go back, try to identify for a moment us with the way how people in a, in a very different place and time looked at media. This is my, um, what I got from uh, reading a lot of works by the so-called uh, men mental historians, the French Histoire de la Mentalité, especially Marc Bloch's writing in that some 1930s and 40s, and Fernand Brodel's, some of Brodel's and Emmanuel Leroy Ladurie's work, this kind of people. I'm not main mentioning them here. So it's important to understand that there are alternative parts that are not only possible, so like what if this had happened, but actually happened, and they are waiting to be uncovered. Um, I mentioned already that I'm interested in cyclically recurring phenomena. So, and um, I've been using this concept, topoi, 
or topos in the in the singular to explain how the way the way how these certain ideas keep on appearing and sometimes disappearing in in uh, media culture so this means that it's a way of tracing the dynamics of continuity and rupture so if i want to express the the mission of media archaeology in a very very condensed short way i guess this last bullet point here is the, is uh, says it all so in some sense for me media archaeology research is the life of uh, topoi or topos replaced within concrete historical circumstances is identifying the top points and then trying to understand why and how they appeared in certain uh, cultural circumstances okay um, just some examples this is um, another of my great favorites that I often use um, it's a cartoon from Harper's Weekly 1860 and um, it was a reaction to the appearance of a of an important and influential medium at the time, which was the stereoscope, the 3D, uh, the first devices for viewing 3D photographs. This technology was first publicly introduced at the London World's Fair, the so-called Crystal Palace exhibition in 1851. Um, some of the first devices were donated for Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, and this got a lot of popularity, a lot of attention because of that. And it became like a, like a mania in the 50s, 1850s. So thousands and thousands of these devices were sold, millions of cards. So it became a real, true mass medium that was pretty much forgotten until about 15 or 20 years ago when people, many people, but I also probably was one of them, started paying attention to that. And I was actually interested in this in the context of virtual reality around 1990. So trying to see whether, how that idea about immersion in the virtual worlds had been anticipated. Anyway, what's interesting here, I think it is the, is the way how the story goes. This is another visual discourse. You see the father bringing that device and the, uh, cards to the family and uh, it's, a, it's a harmonious family like a family circle where the mother's seen reading and, and they, they are sort of like having Victorian happy good time so to say early Victorian happy good time and then the this was still a society where people had servants the servant this is sort of like a typical kind of racist like like joke that you often find in the material. So that she's curious, but of course she looks at this device from the wrong end. This is also this is a, a, another topos that that certain kind of ethno, ethnic groups are uh, making fun at the way how they just simply cannot figure out certain technologies. They always have to look at it from the wrong end at first. Then she turns it around and. Uh, this is interesting representation. And obviously, this is a big 3D photo of a, of a skeleton pointing her state in the eye, poking her in the eye. This is another topos, by the way, that I have seen repeated so many times in like a, like a cheesy uh, uh, C, sort of like B, uh, C, B, D, E, really low level. Uh, movies, uh, 3D movies, like I once went to a 3D kino in St. Petersburg and they showed this some kind of forgotten Korean film and it was the only, only about poking you in the eye, so it's exactly the same thing. And um, the other interesting thing here is that then uh, of course the uh, stereoscomania starts in infiltrating the family. Uh, the um, pets Get, get, get addicted by the media. And this is another topos. I think I often hear it, you know, when I talk about this. I talk so many, in so many places. And people start saying, hmm, yes, you there. 
Well, I would like to talk about my cat and my cat's addiction to television. <laughs> but my cat only looks at certain kind of television. My cat is very interested in, in, in soccer, but you know, that doesn't care about other things. Then someone else says, well, my dog actually, and so on. And uh, so this idea about animals' relationship to media is another topos. And uh, then, of course, these, these kids get totally, totally addicted. And in the end, you see the happy Victorian, early Victorian family has been destroyed. So we, you have these human wrecks, ruins, uh, cross-eyed people, no books or anything at all. And uh, what, what's interesting is, is, of course, that, that this is exactly the topos that has been applied to television, to, inter, to the internet, to the, to the video games and all these things. So you see that when, when I first saw this, it was a kind of a revelation for me that, oh my God, it's 1860s and uh, it's more than, it's, it's before uh, what we usually call media culture and it's all, all there. So it's a, it's a motive that travels in culture because we have other, other I might also in this case almost say counter discourses because this is another version of that. It emphasizes the harmonious, harmonizing factor of the media. This is the same device, you see, the stereoscope that this um, lady is, uh, young lady is using on the, on the right. These are the stereo card, the mass-produced uh, 3, 3D cards you find on the table. And I think it's very significant that these people are around the table. There's a har harmonious circle. And, and the media here is explained to keep the social unit together. It's, um, of course, motivated. As you see, this picture comes from Sears and Roebuck um, mail order catalog. So it's in the interest of the Sears and Roebuck to, of course, not to emphasize the fact that this potentially this device you know turns into these cross-eyed wrecks, human wrecks, but actually this this positive impact of the media. But it's it's there, and um, this is a rare stereo card, uh, early stereo card from my collection. Um, what's interesting is that in this particular case, you see it's pretty much the same situation. The table, there are actually several stereo viewers here and then the cards, and then the guy and the ladies are, are looking, looking at them. Now, we are in a fortunate situation that unlike in many other cases, we know the story behind this card. This is actually, um, um, this, the, this, this gentleman here, is, his name is uh, Godin, and he was one of the pioneering stereo uh, sellers in, in Paris. This is an advertising card he obviously gave to his clients. So it's not nothing, it's nothing spontaneous. It's, it's all post. And I guess it's uh, Godin and his wife and maybe their daughters, or could be even shop ladies. So it was in his interest, actually, to emphasize this harmonizing side of the uh, stereo. Or something like this. This is the spirograph, um, another thing that I'm researching. And this is a, an early vision about the um, phonograph. This is uh, from the, the graphi graphic, uh, which was a popular journal published, published in the States. Um, Edison um, introduced uh, his device uh, towards the end of 1877. This was the first uh, device that could record this human sound and play it back. It's called the phonograph. It's the predecessor to all the, all the uh, recorders and, and playback devices uh, for sound. And um, one, of the, one of the sort of like fantasies for, for its use was like that. And once again, you see the same family, same kind of family sitting around the table uh, and the device on the table. This was only one use that was proposed. Edison himself thought that it would actually make its fortune as a business machine and not as a something for the private, private people. And uh, radio and television. 
So the media as a social cement. I'm, it would be very interesting to speculate about, speculate about how this is related, let's say, with the, with the idea of the um, uh, esoteric communication in the 19th century. Because I mean that the other situation in which in the late 19th century people often sat around the table feeling connected was the um, was this spir spiritistic seance. So like putting your hands on the table or touching each other, things like that. Uh, there's some research, um, particularly by Jeff Jeffrey Scones, trying to build on these connections between sort of like uh, esoteric media and the, the uh, technical media in the 19th century. I'm not going to go into that, but it's something that definitely makes sense to, to think about. And of course, then the happy, uh, ping, happy Pong uh, gaming family from the 19, early 1970s. But um, <clears throat> there are also certain kind of cultural discourses that sometimes point out, you know, the kind of the um, falsity or the kind of like uh, fake nature of that kind of discourses. And for instance, this could be one of them. This was um, one of the numerous, numerous uh, sort of like uh, novelty TV sets proposed in the 1950s. What's interesting here is that it looks like just a simple TV, you see, like a television set, and that that uh, father and the mother can watch together. But it is really two TVs in one, one case. So there are two uh, cathode ray tubes inside, and there is a system of kind of mirrors and screens here, uh, which causes, um, which makes it possible to uh, view different channels at the same time if you use certain kind of glasses. Uh, so it basically shows that that something just simply didn't work in this idealistic uh, idealistic uh, discourse we we can trace over all these uh, decades. So the fact that in the end, of course, the father and the mother didn't want to watch the same channel. They don't want to do the same thing, but they can pretend to be together. So this was a technological way of trying to mend that problem in culture. But of course, it's fake and totally failed. You know that. The other thing, of course, was that th that's always repeated is that these technologies are great because they will keep the teenagers at home already in the 19th century. I mean that the streets are so, the streets will destroy our kids, you know, that they will turn into criminals and whatever. So the uh, radio amateur equipment or the radio sets are fantastic for the boy, boy, you know, the boy hobbyist. And the same thing with the TV. But of course the kids didn't want to watch the same things with their parents. So what do you do? Often you ended up buying several TV sets and I think that's a solution that I've seen in many, many homes. But you see that I'm just trying to kind of show you that, that there are certain models of behavior that are repeated and in a way travel from media to media. And there are also ways of trying to kind of counter those those, those, those models and, and, and there are also interesting cultural products that sometimes reveal the certain kind of actual cultural ruptures which may be bubbling under that situation and for instance something like this is, is uh, I think it's a good example. Okay, I'll um, say still a few words about this idea about the topos because it's, um, it has got such an important role in my thinking and um, so I, I guess I need to explain wh what I really mean by it. Um, where I think I actually originally got it from uh, is a book that I have here which is uh, called European Literature and the, and the Latin Middle Ages. Uh, I, I, studied, um, I studied cultural history and this was something that I encountered early on in my studies when I was a young person, so like 20, something like that. And it had a, had a deep in impact on me. And I, don't, I didn't know exactly why, you know, as it often happens. It took me a long time to kind of really understand the connection between 
these, these things and what I was trying to do. And I think it's quite interesting to think about that. So this was a book that um, I'm not going to talk about really, but it tried to explain how the, um, the um, learning and the literature and the philosophy of the classical antiquity was transmitted to the, to the modern age, through the Middle Ages. And, uh, and he created an idea of the topos as, as a sort of like a vehicle for that kind of, that kind of uh, cultural tran transition and transportation, I would even say. So that's the name of the book. And, um, but I don't actually take it uh, as just like Curtius does it. So he seemed to be saying that there are certain kinds of topoi that are sort of like a kind of a, like um, cliches or sort of like frozen uh, elements of culture that appear over and over again. And uh, if you read that book closely, you notice that he's um, sometimes evoked the idea about uh, Jung's deep psychology and uh, the idea about the Jungian archetype, which is basically a kind of like a form which Jung saw as sort of like Carl Jung, so as kind of a typical of human humans in a way as a species, something that is beyond culture. Culture is that that changes and evolves because of human intervention, what we we do. But he felt that you know that there is there's something beyond the, that culture, and these are the sort of like archetypes that can then come into our dreams, for instance, something that just appears somehow from from somewhere. I don't believe in this. I think that these are culturally defined, molded and transmitted elements. Now the origins for this kind of thinking actually came from the uh, theory of rhetorics um, of the ancients. Um, there are some definitions for that, like Quintilianus uh, said that they are storehouses of trains of thought. And uh, so systematically organized formulas serving a practical purpose, composing of orations. And this means that these, uh, these things were used as so-called mnemonic devices, uh, aids for memory. They were related with the idea about the memory palace, for instance. So if you needed to speak for three hours, so you had to have a way of memorizing that uh, because you couldn't check from the, from, the, from the papers or something like that. So you would actually use this for like formulated, uh, very, very evolved, highly evolved system of this kind of formulas. But when the classical civilization started collapsing, the, this rhetoric tradition, in a way, uh, lost its meaning. And, but but top, topoi, which means elements of that kind of thinking, survived in all kinds of literary and, I would say, cultural traditions. And these could be uh, different kinds of formulas, like it says, stylistic or allegorical formulas. And, and uh, Curtius felt that these make up the like he says, the building blocks of cultural traditions, and they appear and disappear in turn. Just trying to go a little bit faster. So, just an example how I think this kind of... So I, I think that we can uh, identify... So media culture is part of oh, culture, of course. Um, I think we can identify this kind of topoi on many, many levels if we look at the way how people have fantasized about technology. This is, for instance, um, something from, um, from a really interesting book uh, called uh, Le XXe Siècle, the 20th century, which was written and illustrated by Albert Robida, the French illustrator and contemporary of Jules Verne, knew Jules Verne actually quite well. Not as great writer, but really interesting as an il illustrator. So he, um, in that, this book, he uh, draws a sort of like a picture of this future 20th century society that is almost entirely dependent on media. So there are all these screens that basically serve various different kinds of purposes. It's not just like television, but it's, it's picture phone like interactive communications and all kinds of roles. So the screen has become a serious element of culture. And one of those many ideas in that book is, is this. Uh, une erreur du téléphonoscope. This is the, basically the wrong number idea. So it's a, it's a picture phone. And, and it happens that, that somebody has, um, these guys has taken the wrong number and all of a sudden this, this picture of this, uh, this 
lady appears on the on the screen and this is a sort of like an idea that is repeated over and over again and I think it, it has turned into a kind of a topos this is just one example of that this is a, a, a cartoon from judge in 1929 uh, which is quite interesting in the sense that as you see here the there's sort of like the gender relationships have been uh, turned around so we have the lady who's now trying to make the phone call and actually the guy who's kind of uh, surprised in, in, in his bath. Uh, now I haven't, I haven't found any other, from the same period, any other sort of like fragments of this course with this sort of like reversal of these gender roles. So I, I, cannot, I wouldn't play too much cultural weight on this thing. So it is definitely interesting that it shows that somebody could imagine these things sort of like turned around but whether this uh, really uh, represented some kind of a, like a more wider cultural shift in, in these uh, these relationships is actually would would require much 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 more work than i have done so i don't want to make that kind of a that kind of a proposal another thing so we find really interesting thing, let's say, from the 20s and 30s material. For instance, this one here, something must be done about this television menace. First of all, as you see, this was a time when the television was just beginning to come into culture. So, the, so the, it had, its cultural forms had not been sort of like solidified, so to say. So the technology had, it was now functional, even though barely. So people fantasized how that would be used. And this idea about like two-way communication was always part of the imaginary around television. So that it would be not just broadcasting, but, but two-way communication. And it's, it's quite understandable also that this kind of idea would appear uh, quite soon. So like, of course, that people try to hide their true emotions, you know, that when they are connect, contacted. So the, the, I think the uh, implication here is that it's much, much easier on the telephone if you, one doesn't see your face. But so that basically you would be using this almost like no theater like masks, you know, like showing a certain kind of mood even though you were just absolutely devastated, you know, that you, she doesn't want to go to the, to the football match, you know, of course, she wanted to go to the theater and things like that. But what's interesting is, I think is here that, that I think that this idea that we see in this cartoon is much related to what we, we started hearing in the early times of the internet, as Victoria definitely remembers very well, all this discussion about people hiding their identities and posing as someone else, posing as another gender, all these, these kinds of things. So um, one argument I would like to make is that that kind of idea about the role play happening in the context of, of, of media and network media is, is not something that was born with the internet. But it was, it was very much activated, you know, within that context in many ways. But I think the, the motive and the idea had existed in culture already at that point. And uh, we could say that that is a kind of a topo, topos. So I think this is the final one of these, these screens here. So that um, where I'm trying to say something, why I think the topos uh, appears and what, what it means so um, I would say that they appear frequently in the discourses of media culture, providing molds for presenting and encountering the new. So the encountering the new, uh, so kind of new media things, that is always a, often a sort of like point of crisis. And, and uh, very often it seems like uh, advertisers, uh, educators, sometimes users themselves, uh, find it difficult, you know, to to say what what should we do about this this particular medium. So they need something, uh, and I think that the topos very often come to serve as this kind of molds for experience, molds for expressing certain ideas. And, and there's also the other thing is that technological, cultural, and mental changes I think don't always take place at the same time. So ideas about uses and meanings of new technology can reflect older ones. And this is also very important to understand. So that when we think about the most recent technology that we live in, the ideas that, for instance, advertisers use are often very, very old ones. 
And, um, and I think that when there are moments of crisis and transformation in culture, we see particularly many of these kind of topoi evoked by different parties in, in culture. And often they try to help or persuade consumers to adapt to changing mediascapes. And um, this is what I like, like to say often. So the newest of the new is built on the oldest of the old. And this is often the way how it happens in, in advertising, for instance. So, and I think the most obvious example, it will be so real, you will break through the screen. This is a, such an old idea. Why, why does every new plasma screen or whatever have to be advertised with that this way? I, I think it's, it's a lot, rather paradoxical, isn't it? The oldest ideas are the ones that give them form to the, to the, to the most recent things in culture. Okay, a couple of examples. I'm going to go through these quickly and so that maybe we can also have some time for discussion. Um, one of the things I've been interested in this um, is this um, anth anth anthropomorphization of technology. So the how to how the technology, new technology of a certain moment is is represented as sort of like um, possessing certain kind of human attributes. And this is um, let's say an example from the early times of photography. Uh, I don't know how well you know the history of photography, but phot photography was introduced in public in 1839, 1840. Um, first in, uh, in, uh, in France, uh, when um, uh, actually um, Louis Daguerre, who was one of the inventors of the technology together with Niepce, he uh, d made an agreement with the French Academy of Sciences to donate it that to the world, you know, not to patent that, you know, commercially, but donate it to the world. And, and, and in response, the French government gave him a pension, quite a big pension, you know. So there was a sort of like the other side to that whole thing. Yeah. Okay. So. Movies, basically, the first movies were shown. That is a, that's a topic for another topic. Where, when, when did movies start? You know, it's a very complex thing, but around 1895. So it means, yes, that's right. Around 1895, but I mean, that who was the first one? What, 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 that, what qualifies as movies and things like that is a very complex historiographical problem. So, and um, what I'm interested in that that we have this um, actual sort of like figure in culture, which is something kind of new, which is the photographer. And because of the early nature of the early, early photographic technology, you, used, you had to have this hood, you know, to kind of to make sure that no other light leakage happens, you know, so that you can, because the exposure times were often very long, and uh, it and the em emulsions you would use were quite, rather slow, so it took a long, long time. You didn't have any mechanical shutters; you just opened the gap and closed it. So you we would have to sort of like pose in, in such a way. And I'm very interested in the way how that that became a sort of like very, very strong sort of like inspiration for for the imagination of of different. Ways. We have actually a huge tradition of images like that. And what we see happening here is, of course, a creation of a new kind of a species. Uh, humans have two eyes, but monsters often have one eye, one this glowing eye of the cyclops or something like that. All of a sudden, we have this techno, techno biological cyclops roaming in culture, scaring people, you know, and so on. So the some kind of, a, you know process of hybridization happens in imagination. And uh, this is the best of all. Uh, this says, well, front and back view of a very curious animal that we have seen going about loose the other day. It has been named by Dr. Günther, whoever that Dr. Günther happened to be, I don't know, Elephants Photographicus, the photographic, photographing, photographic elephant. And here you see much, much more clearly that 
it is shown as a new, very strange you know, hybrid, hybrid creature where the, the legs of the photographic tripod have been turned into sort of like kind of animal's legs and, or something like that. And um, this is a, another interesting, this is a late 19th, uh, late 19th century little um, bronze statue dealing with this idea. So you see that the same kind of creature that we have encountered many times in visual traditions in the 19th century um, is, is represented. But the, with the difference, when you look at it from the top, all of a sudden you, you notice that this, this strange creature is no other than Satan, the devil himself kind of like an interpretation placed on top of this tradition that, that's developing. So what we see here, I think I could claim, is actually the, I, would, I like to say it this way, the birth of the cyborg. Because that's actually, I think it's a good point to make in the sense that the cyborg is something we associate very easily with, with the digital culture and, and contemporary culture. Cyborg is this new kind of creature that, that is, is born out of the, like a little by little sneaking sort of like hybridization between biotechnology or other kinds of technologies and the human body. The body, body becomes connected with this technology. But this shows that in imagination, the cyborg has been living in culture actually for quite a, quite a while already. Um, we might say that maybe the, um, in some sense, this, um, also humans using the stereoscope became kind of cyborgs. At least in certain kind of representations. I have a, actually a large collection of these uh, images that I've collected over many years of, of people using these media devices. I'm, I'm very intrigued by that idea. What does it tell about the media culture itself? These are amateur photographs from my collection. This is about 1915, these little girls. And this is like 1930s from a farm. And you see that these people are posing, they're hiding their eyes. Now the issue is that, that we don't know if they, these are just naive photos, you know. These people just basically, it was kind of fun to take a photo of them. Studio portraits never showed these things because uh, in a studio, the most important thing is the human face for a studio photographer. It's, it's part of his, his, his professional, you know, like professional thinking. But in amateur photographs, you could show people using these devices and hide the face of that, that person. But um, this is one of the articles I'm working. I have uh, many things that I'm somehow working on and many things that I have half finished or 75% finished or 25% finished. This is about 38% finished. An article about this iconographic tradition of people using these stereoscopes. I have a lot of material and hopefully I will one day finish that. And um, I think that this kind of tradition also has to do with this idea about the birth of the so I would also call it the slow birth of the cyborg. The idea about dressing up in technology that we find in the, in the 19th century. We have really fantastic examples. I have quite, quite a lot of these. One of these ideas was dressing up uh, for certain kind of society parties in photographs with, with the photographic camera as your hat. And surely, I mean, it has to do with the wearable technology somehow. These are figures, uh, uh, characters in a, in a ballet about, about technology. So women dressed as certain allegorical manifestation of certain kind of technology. It was like an 1890s, a ballet presentation. And then we have many of these things like uh, electric light dresses in the late 19th century at the, at the um, world's fairs and, you know, places like that. So where people are, are concretely dressed up in this kind of electric technology. They are wired. Their dresses are wired. And then they would be lit up, you know, like that. 
So this is a, a, a tradition, it's not just one, one of a kind thing. This is Miss, Miss Cornelia Vanderbilt posing as the electrified statue of liberty, holding an elect torch, which is actually an electric bulb, and a kind of a, like a tableau of Ivan presentation in the late 19th century. And what I'm curious about is the way, for instance, how these things link and connect with, with these artistic traditions. This was actually the topic of my talk just in this recent conference at, uh, at the Refresh, uh, first international Conf conference on media, art, histories, science and technology, just like last week. So this is a Gutai artist uh, whose name was, uh, her name was Atsuko Tanaka. And this is her very famous artwork from the 1950s called The Electric Dress. That she, so she really made this very elaborate dress covering herself in elect, electric light, light bulbs. And then she performed these all kinds of crazy performances with that, with that dress. And um, now I'm, I'm curious about the fact that, you know, I, I can't tell whether Atsuka Tanaka ever knew about the tradition of popular spectacles of women dressing up in technology. Uh, or whether this idea just appeared somehow from, from somewhere. But surely I think it had a, had a very important meaning for, for women and women artists in Japan in the 50s and 60s. So where the women's sort of like roles in society were, were very, very limited. So in a way, breaking yourself loose from that, associating yourself with things like technology and doing becoming part of this sort of like performance as art movements was a way for courageous women actually to create a kind of a different kind of identity for themselves and I mean that there were many others as you probably know Yoko Ono and others who also did, did, did this, this kind of transition but uh, Atsuko Tanaka was a pioneer in this sense in the 1950s. So talking about moving from those sort of like uh, discursive manifestations we could also and I'm just going to show you this briefly this is also something I'm very interested in, but I'm actually talking about this much more in these design classes. So is this, this connection of people with, with, with technology in working life and, and the implementation of certain design solutions and, uh, and, uh, and uh, social relations in that situation, like this, this key issue in this picture is, is of course the, the you see the very stereotype poses of these ladies who are actually using uh, mechanical devices for, you know, that um, I think it's kind of like um, working on the checks, bank checks. And then, the, of course, this guy, guys who are standing there being the su supervisors. I'm just going to go through this quickly. Or oh, the telephone exchange with these ritualized relationships between people. And this, the other side, of which, is, which is this ritualized uh, forms of exercise that were just connected and linked to that kind of work. Uh, it's really interesting in many ways. Uh, and once again, these discourses, this idea about the happy cyborg, the, the woman who's, who spends one, most of her life physically uh, encapsulated in technology, of course, using these this, uh, microphone, head, headphone co combinations or or devices, devices like that. The idealistic, this is an interesting Art Nouveau, sort of like uh, sheet music, um, post a cover for a sheet music about the, uh, the, the young lady, young telephone lady, and the switchboard operator on roller skates from San Francisco, once again trying to say it's not too bad, it's, it's funny, it's kind of groovy, whatever. No. And, um, but then the idea about the entangled operators who anyway smiles. And then uh, one extreme, which is this, 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 these people turned into the uh, objects for this kind of physiological testing about interfaces and work. This is a real photo, it's not, not a sort of like fake or, or, or a performance art piece or anything at all. 1927, this, this special device that's testing this, this secretary while she's typing on the, on, the, on the machine. And in the end, of course, the, the woman turns into a machine. This is a wonderful, wonderful uh, picture, I think, which basically talks about 
the uh, replacement of the human telephone switchboard with an automated one. And this means that the human woman is now replaced by this automated switch switching center. But, but her sort of like shadow figure is, is merged with this technology. There would be much, much more to say about this and how it relates with the idea about woman as the other uh, relationship between woman and, and, and the machine in, in, in the sort of like male dominated society and things, but I'm leaving it out. This is another one. And I like to actually associate this with this one, which I found from the Sky magazine on, the, on my flight to Europe. This is for this new uh, noise cancelling headphones. So you see, it's not so much the noise of the plane than the noise of these, these obviously, these ladies. Uh, and uh, what is interesting is that this idea where you have the heads replaced by, by technology is actually directly in line with those, uh, those uh, early cyborgian visions about photography and things like that. I'm still kind of trying to imagine, figure how that could lead, connect with some other things. I haven't actually written this part. But I think it's going to be another article, the kind of the slow birth of the cyborg, I call it. And, um, and I think it's also linked with earlier traditions where human heads were replaced by animal heads. Because in earlier, sort of like, shall we say, pre-technological times, the relationship between humans and animals, also pre-Darwinian -pre times, represented a certain kind of important rupture. So the humans could be turned into a monster by replacing the head with an animal's head not with a photographic camera or a loudspeaker and things like that. So I'm trying to imagine or figure out how I could associate that tradition of like human figures with animal heads with this, this later tradition. So this is a, another article that I hope to finish one day. Look out what's happening behind your back. This is another thing that I'm very interested in. I'm just showing, at some point I will actually stop, but I, maybe I'll show you two more kind of case studies because this leads to now to the field of peep media. Okay, look out, what's happening behind your back? Of course. You shouldn't be too immersed, too interested in using your telescope because you might lose your wife. Or the kaleidoscope. Look at this poor guy. He's so interested in the kaleidoscope that he doesn't know this, this, what's happening behind his back. Or don't get interested in photography. This is an early daguerreotype camera. That is the cousin of this guy. And uh, that's the wife, of course, of this poor guy who's been turned into this ridiculous version of the monster, you know. He has this one single eye again, but now he's sort of like a ridiculous loser. The original, original uh, caption for, for this, this picture is that he says, he says, oh, I don't see anything at all. What's wrong? I don't see anything. And then the, the cousin says, well, hmm, keep on looking, keep on looking. It will appear. Okay, later in the 19th century, this guy turns into the door-to-door -door salesman for stereoscopic photographs. So here he has his sample uh, viewer, the um, suitcase full of stereo card samples, and of course he's, he's kissing the wife of this poor guy. This is the same motive made by another company, the husband, the wife, and the uh, Dodo doll sales, salesman. You know, this is a part of the uh, famous uh, topos of the, of the vacuum clean seller. Vacuum cleaner seller. This is a st stereo. This is a magic lantern. Uh, the same idea. So there's a magic lantern and a stand and a lady and a husband. And um, it happens that the lady, the husband gets these, these horns out of the projection. And there's a reason for that, because when you open, actually, this door in the print, you see this, this officer there kissing the hand, secretly kissing the hand of the lady. This is a peep show. The so showman here, 
his coins, on, and uh, this is a mother, her son, her daughter, and again that officer appears, you know, behind her back. Now, this is about painting. A secret love letters I exchanged by this, this suitor and the, the wife. So it, it's not just about media, it can be a painting. So that shows, just, just you, shows you a quick example about how, how certain idea travels from, through all these media, all these visual media, in a, in a, in a, from decade to decade. So the topos is appearing over and over again. And I, I think it's, um, <clears throat> what it says, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting commentary on the sort of like the need for balancing your enthusiasm for new, new media with certain kind of realistic attitudes, which means that, that these, these are all related with so-called manias. Kaleidoscomania, stereoscomania, daguerotypomania, all are manias, and that means that there's an excessive amount of attention to these things in the, in the media machine themselves. So, and, and when that happens, so that the, I think the message is that then you lose control of your physical surroundings. A, another topos that, that we can find from our time as well, I'll show you. This is a mutoscope, it's from my collection. These are posters. This is another peep medium, early moving picture machine uh, introduced in 1897. And uh, some examples of the fantasies. This is the virtual museum, where the idea was that people were fantasizing that you, soon there will be museums where instead of looking at the paintings like that, it would be more interesting to see them as mediated versions inside these peep show machines. Then, of course, these interesting ideas where the reality and uh, the kind of virtuality start mixing up. This is a kin Edison, Edison kinetoscope, another peep show machine for uh, seeing movie loops inside and then the, he, he's saying it feels so real that 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 it, it feels like your feet are getting wet. Another idea we often find and then this idea luckily I brought my umbrella. This is an early movie presentation. And this one I like a lot. It's quite interesting. It's about he says they have just uh, it's sketched on the pier just after the arrival of the boat. So they have obviously been sailing on, a, on, a, on the sea and they just, just got on the pier and the guy is peeping into a mutoscope where he sees a movie, kind of flip movie of the waves saying, my eye Mar Maria, come and have a look here. The motion of the waves is simply grand. So this idea that this mediated experience starts taking over for that, that real experience. And I would like to refer to my very first picture of that SUV uh, ad, you know, which showed the kids looking at the screen inside. That the screen world is more interesting than what you could see outside the, the window. So it is a, sort of like a variation, I think, of the same uh, topos. Or oh, this typical, this is a just, a, I think it's a bad, bad cartoon from the New Yorker. It's not high definition anything, it's a window. So the fact that, you know, we get so used to thinking that it's a kind of wall-mounted plasma screen or whatever that, you know, mm, it's a window. But you see that how these ideas are sort of like really linked to a sort of like a, like a very long tradition that traverse, traverses in a way this, this whole, uh, Field. This is a um, place this, this wife is trying to drag her, her husband away from the peep show machine, obviously showing uh, like naked ladies. And he said, well, why marry so that anyway I will just keep on, keep on, keep on until I see it to the end, whatever, whatever you do. And uh, here's a uh, variation of the same. But this is an interesting because here once again this um, here it's reversed. You see, it's an old husband and a young, beautiful lady. They are married. Obviously, they have some problems in their sex life. I think. There, you see, the guy is like, no, 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 no. 
And then the guy sees this device and, and peeks inside. Mm. And then ah, you see that he somehow he's, you know, his look has changed and the same. And off they go back home. So that it can form other type of sort of like stimulus maybe. This is um, another picture and what's interesting is that just referring to the research by Linda Williams, who's a very famous uh, femi feminist media scholar, Williams has uh, based her analysis of these sexual associations li linked with this device on the position of the of the crank, which which he thinks associated with the sort of like a male masturbation, so that um, th this is an early movie where the actually this whole thing is actually seen happening, so that he's looking at that and actually masturbating at the same time. So that is interesting. I don't know exactly how much um, whether I agree with Linda Williams's analysis, where she actually reads certain. Um, sort of like features of the me media apparatus as significant. So he thinks that the way how the mirror scope was constructed, the way that the, they put the sort of like um, crank on the front side that turned into sort of like a male ma masturbatory type of pleasure machine or something like that. But I, I'm not quite sure because I mean that there's more and more evidence now that women, young women, were also fascinated by this device. You know, then that would give a totally different meaning, you know, to that d device. We don't know exactly yet, but so that's one of the things that I'm trying to um, also research. This, this, these things are related to this peep media thing. I wrote a long article, but I think I, maybe I'll be able to turn it into a book, but it needs a little bit more work already. Peep media, yes. I have great pictures for that. And this is quite interesting, I think, that when we get to the French, French side, so that then the, the topic also turns, turns into something else. Of course, we, we see this guy who is like a typical French pickpocket, but, 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 but something funny happens. So that, of course, this is like a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's quite obvious yeah, that from the sort of like heterosexual, there's a kind of a, like a, shift to the, to the implied homosexual uh, uh, situation in, in this particular case. I like this text. When I see a naked woman, I can always feel her caresses. But you also see that it is based on the same, it's also a variation of those things with the rain and, and water, you know, that, that kind of things. But, but linking it with this uh, sort of like a sexual topos in, in this case. What's interesting is also that these toposes are also stolen this was in uh, February, on February 26, in 1910. And uh, just a few months later, uh, a British uh, publication published a very similar type of, uh, type of cartoon, which is kind of boring, you know. It tries to sort of like, either they, um, they see, here the artist didn't understand that homosexual undertone that was quite clear as part of the joke, or, or he tried to neutralize it, but it, it's like, Oh, I say that's funny, ha, ha, ha. A chap having his pocket picket, ha, ha, ha. So it, it's, uh, this is the edge. Yeah, it totally loses the edge, which made that French version so interesting, actually. Do we have time to discuss Yeah, that? let me show you just a few things, and, and then I will stop. And this is the German version of that, which is the, really the masochistic version, you know. <laughs> this guy is, is peeping at these, these uh, sex, sexual <laughs> pictures. And look at what, what's happening to him. And here in the end, the end he says, it was the greatest 15 minutes of my life. Yeah, and, and he's sort of like in this post-orgastic state, you know, that I guess. But this is where it came from, and which is quite interesting. And uh, here we jump back more than 100 years. You see, this is, um, this is a print satirical print where this figure here is John Bull. John Bull is the personification of the British people. You know. And uh, John Bull is look, peeping into this peep show box where the government, the British government is showing all these illusionary deceptions. 
And at the same time, the government officially is stealing his money for waging another war. So the war is, war is funded by making these, giving these people these illusions. And think about the United States, you know, if, if anything like this may have happened, you know, in, in recent times. And maybe I'll actually end up with this one, or actually the, this and the next one, just showing, showing how these ideas travel in time. This is a cartoon from the early times of the virtual reality mania, uh, early 90s. There were actually all these kinds of VR games where you actually would use the head-mounted display and then do some funny-looking things. And this was obviously virtual reality baseball where you see this guy, as usual, as it always happened, helping this person to put on the head-mounted display and the data glove. And obviously it looks so stupid and, and whatever, that in the end he just decides to take the very material uh, baseball bat and just smash it on the guy. So once again, uh, virtual reality, when you, when you are in the virtual reality, you lose part of the control of what's happening around you. You are actually very, very clumsy and stupid in the head-mounted display. And I surely know that I, I, was a, I was quite interested in these technologies and I, I traveled to all, practically all the research centers around 1990, 1991, 92 to try all the different applications. So the heat lab and I, I, that was the great times in Finland when there was a lot of money, a lot of funding, you know, grants for this kind of young enthusiastic researchers. So I tried quite a, quite a few stupid applications. And jumping back again to 1855, a portrait of a distinguished photographer who has just succeeded in focusing a view to his complete satisfaction. And you see, it's another cyborg here, twisting his eye, single eye, just at the moment of being sort of like pushed to the ground. Uh, so, I could show you many, many more things, but I think this is probably enough. Um, I was actually, even yesterday, I was thinking whether, whether to give this talk or another talk, which is about mobile media. But I think I will have, a, have another opportunity to talk about the ways how I think this mobi mobile media came to be. That's uh, the mo my most recent sort of like ongoing thing. But I have a, have a, will have an article out. It's, it's done uh, very, very soon. But so, Okay, anyway, I just wanted to give you an idea about this uh, media archaeology, the way I understand it, and also then through a few case studies, try to uh, explain how this, this topoi working culture. And uh, basically, I think that it is something that's very important to pay attention to, because I mean that if we think that being critical consumers, critical developers of media culture still makes, makes, makes sense, so that we have to look at these things not just on the not just at the, on the on the surface level but actually try to go deeper and understand that that things that are happening now are not necessarily uh, unrelated with, with what in many cases has happened already decades and hundreds of years ago so considering that this this temporal perspective i think makes us understand better the, the idea interplay between novelty, new things and old things, novelties and, and sort of like old cliches. And that's basically, I think, the, the core of this media archaeological approach. I understand that. So that's, that's all I had to say. Thank you. I will start. Yes, yes, please. Is this mic on? Do you does it amplify? Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your collection? Yes. The one that eventually ended up and bought yeah. in yeah. Finland. And then another sub question to that is would you say that you could take any new thing and dig into it as part of your process as to what are different links? Historically, to that's that a, new device is—is is that correct? To okay, say? that's. A, I mean, I will. I will start from the. 
possible, I would like to start from the second second part, so that that <clears throat> so that can any new thing be read as a topos, so connect linked with these earlier things? And, and that's a very good question because I hear it sometimes also. Because I mean that I don't, I don't, I'm not going to say that this is like I'm selling like a patent medicine. I'm the, not the medicine man of the 21st century, you know. Like uh, I'm not saying that anything new, everything happening in culture can easily be explained as a topos. That would be stupid, because there is. I mean, we, culture is is always a combination of evolving things, uh, linear processes, and and sort of like I would say like a cyclical process. So it's a combination of these complex combination. And I think that <clears throat> even if we think about this most cliched field of all, which is this uh, new technology-related advertising, which, which I think often really clearly uses this to topoi, I sometimes find things that, uh, that kind of surprise me a little bit, you know, like, and this is another thing that I recently found um, for this um, tough book, tough book, uh, laptop computer. And I, I looked at this picture, upgrade, and I saw this businessman leaning on the on the screen, and I said, "Oh my God, this is an idea I don't I think I haven't seen before." You know, I've looked at these thousands of thousands of pictures from here and there. Hmm, maybe this is not a topos. Maybe they even came up with something new. Or, or then I started thinking, "Oh, is it just a bad and confused idea?" Because. What does it tell us, you know, that this businessman is leaning on that, that huge screen instead of doing something else with the screen? Maybe it's just a bad, bad design, you know, it's, maybe it's a bad idea. But I'm not, going to, I'm not saying that, that this is a patent medicine, you know, to explain everything in culture. It's just one approach that in, in some cases, and I would say in quite many cases, gives an additional uh, way of reading and understanding and grasping these media media cultural processes so there are many many other approaches that that are equally useful i would say but anyway the other question is just about my my collection uh, so so yeah i mean for a long time i had this uh, habit of collecting these things myself and i, I have been collecting both machines so devices themselves mostly related with the history of the moving image as in some way or, or another or peeping and uh, things like that and uh, i had a large collection that i sold for the finnish state when i was leaving here so that i had a big exhibition in 2000 in a museum of cultural history in helsinki and uh, i showed it to the minister of culture and uh, she uh, was very interested and actually she even started calling her driver okay put it off for another 45 minutes so we actually spent a long long time in the exhibition and like two weeks later I got this message a letter from the Ministry of Culture saying that we have heard that you are planning to move to work in the United States would you consider selling this collection for the Finnish state to be to be placed in a in a new museum of the moving image that is going to be built in uh, as part of the renovated Finnish Science Center, actually outside Helsinki, it's going to happen now. It's actually already under work, so the collection will be there. And so I sold it, but um, I kept uh, some of my most favorite things. And unfortunately, I had been working here already for some time, and so I'd already bought quite a few other things. <laughs> and then uh, as it happens, I had that money, you know. So what do you do with that money? So you buy new things. So I have a new collection already <laughs> here. And I have uh, both these machines and things, but I ha also have a lot of documents. I'm interested in these early documents because they are research, valuable research tools. They don't exist in many cases in any other library or any any archive. So the Getty has a fantastic uh, holdings actually at the Getty Research Center. If anybody is interested in uh, looking at the history of media arts or media culture, so Getty Center has, has plenty. And they are very helpful actually with their documents. But I, I also have, have quite a lot of 
things uh, things myself. Uh, so that's I think it's just a info, and I'm happy to show them actually at some point if people are interested in coming to my place. I'm I always show them everything functions. I have a thing many things from the 18th century, early 19th century, things like that. And a lot yeah. Of not everything, but some of them. But not the best ones, actually. No. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard you mention Dillard Scafidio architects. Dillard Scafidio. And I was curious if there are any other architecture firms with media arts leanings that you're interested in that you'd like to talk about? Yes. Um, what's interesting is that this... Um, so I, I've been doing this media archaeology thing since the early 90s. And, uh, and it looks like it's becoming a little bit of a fashion now. And I have seen some quite interesting um, things appear recently. I mean, that, so we, um, for instance, uh, there was a, it's like a techno music festival somewhere in the States called Media Archaeology recently. Luckily, I have actually re registered those websites, so they, mediaarchaeology.com and org and things like that. So, and then I was um, in Britain in the spring and I went to the Victoria and Albert Museum, the famous design museum. And there was this um, fashion show. And um, so where the, the point, point of this exhibition was to look at contemporary fashion where the people incorporate like historicist references and also sort of like a kind of like historical materials in contemporary designs and things like that. And all that, that whole fashion exhibition was shown in a sort of like a media archaeological settings, you know, that you would peep, peep at those dresses through peep, peep show, peep holes, or they were projected, you know, or something like that. And, and then they had actually, uh, they displayed also some original artifacts like magic lanterns and things like that. Another, another media archaeology meets fashion, you know. And then, then we have, we have uh, uh, both artists, media artists, and designers who are highly conscious about this, this historical uh, uh, dimension and actually are somehow incorporating features into their work. So I, I think that this media archaeological approach is definitely uh, present in, in contemporary art and both art and design work as, as well at this point. That was what I talked about actually in... Uh, in Banff, so I, I also showed many examples about how that how that happens. So, so, so surely, but I mean that there are different, many different ways of using it. So some people really uh, go quite deep into it, so using it really as an inspiration for inventing new things. Others just take certain like kind of more, more, more surface, like like I mentioned this exhibition at the Victoria Albert Museum. So like a aesthetic or stylistic features and things like that. So, and I'm, I'm going to write an article. I'm just working on that article about this, which is going to be in, a, in an M MIT Press book. I have to have it done in, by the end of November. That's based on this uh, talk I just gave. So there'll be more, much, much more references to certain designers and, uh, and um, artists in that, artic in that article. But that surely is, is really happening. And I think we'll see even more in the in the near future. Yes. Yeah, you said, talked about the maid who was looking into the um, that photographic device from the wrong side. I think it, it's a very interesting way because it uh, talks a lot about the history of interaction to products which, you know, which I think this, this thing continues even today that like the products we encounter for the first time, mm -hmm. like uh, is the interface, you know, the, the, is it enough s sufficient to actually, you know, make us do the right, use it in the right way. So I think that from mm -hmm. that I, I, there can be more instances where we can trace back the, you know, the history of interaction from, I think that, that was an interesting point in the... Yes. Yeah, abso absolutely. There's, there would be plenty to say about that topic. I mean, that, of course, in the, like, like you say, I think it, in the end it goes to this idea about interface design. In, in some sense, you know, that's, that's the core. How do you design an interface that tells us how to use it, in, in some sense? But I mean, that, 
if we think about the discursive tradition, that 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 particular example leads to a, like a huge tradition, which, uh, for instance, deals with the way how, let's say, people in uh, in the third world encountered Western technologies. And so it's a kind of a representation of that, often seen from the Western point of view. And uh, for instance, we have seen, um, I have seen uh, pictures where like this, like we say, natives, natives like this, um, see a photographic camera, somebody with a camera. And what they do, they actually come to the camera and they try to peek into the lens of the camera instead of just posing like this. And the reason is that they already knew something else, which was this peep show box, these boxes where there were images inside, because that tradition was very international. It's, it's known from, from Europe to Japan and from many, many countries, from India, from China, from Syria, from per Iran, from Persia, from you name it. So that it went through all that part of the world so maybe Africa as well. So people knew that if there's a box with the round thing, you would probably have to, there's a behavioral code, is that then you walk to that box and you look inside. So this confusions between these technologies is typical. Another example could be um, the confusions, the, the confusions between uh, photographic technology and cinematographic technology among these so-called natives. So that, that um, because photography, like we mentioned, preceded the coming of the moving pictures for by many decades, like a half a, half a century. Of course, the photographic cameras were taken by anthrop cultural anthropologists, for instance, to you know, many, many places among many native populations. So uh, during those decades, so the, they learned certain modes of behavior. First of all, that you were, the, probably the cultural anthropologist would give you money if you will freeze and stare at that box. So this was a very strong code in the late 90s. Yes. But the interesting thing was that when the cultural anthropologists started using movie cameras, went there, they had extreme difficulties in many places of actually telling them that, please move, be natural, whatever. Because, because whatever they did, so they thought that to get money from these Westerners, rich Westerners, we have to stand like a stick, you know, not to move. And, and, and they were totally confused if you went to kind of no, 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 be natural, be natural in front of that camera. So it, it means that there was this confusion between these codes, codes of, you know, behavior associated with the technology. So, so I think it's, um, these are just a few examples of which, which have to do with that, that particular issue that, that that image raises. So I mean that showing that we can actually keep on building on that in a quite another dimension than, than I just showed here. Um, I was just interested in, um, you were talking about uh, a lot about how uh, these images of being obsessed with media or like in doing something and then something happening behind your back or like things falling apart because of that obsession. Yeah. And I, I was thinking that that was really interesting because I think there's a lot of countries now which are just reaching um, this kind of level where they're addressing like this obsession with the media and they address that through like censorship, like a television or internet censorship. And I was just wondering if you could talk about that a little bit because I think in like the Western world where we think about like this freedom of media that like everybody can watch TV and television companies can, you know, mm. pretty much like show to a large degree with like whatever they want yeah. within reason of the culture. Um, there's still many countries where that's, uh, is considered like television or things that can be shown through television or the internet are like really corruptive to the culture. Mm. And so, and also like um, representative of like Western culture, which yeah. could be seen corrupted. Yeah, it's a very interesting field and an interesting question. This this obsession with media, especially if we take it out from the sort of like a, just a Western context. 
really, really interesting question, and uh, I don't think I can answer everything that's related with that because there's so much to say about that. But uh, first of all, I would say that uh, this this idea of um, okay, just a theoretical note at first is that this idea about attention, researching the issue about attention versus sort of like distracted use of media is a is an important topic that has been uh, sort of like researched in the in the past uh, sort of like maybe during the past decade by some people but the mo I think the most important book about that is the uh, Jonathan Creer is uh, the suspensions of perception which we have at the department at Mars it's an interesting book I mean he focuses it mostly on the some theories about attention around the turn of around 1900 so it's um, it's projected in the past but I mean the much of that discussion in the book can be somehow also sort of like applied to contemporary discussions so that and it, it's, it's quite interesting but I mean that but I mean that okay that's that's that thing but then if we think about this idea about media attention within different cultural settings uh, so surely I mean that um, one issue which I think is very interesting is always is this um, the the um, the situation itself whether we are encountering one medium or whether we are actually encountering several media at the same time so uh, in the 19th century in the early stages when people used the stereoscope for instance that was usually the only medium they had access to and that would be the only thing in the home for instance and um, and I, I guess that the situation when you when we end up into the 1920s and 30s and 40s when you have the telephone you have the radio set you have the this kind of photographic viewers and eventually you have the television that of course it, it changes this issue and question about attention the theories of attention quite dramatically how do we respond to surroundings when you have actually several sources of information there instead of just one I think this is also one aspect I, I don't have an answer I'm just asking a question I think it's an issue that also relates to situations where people have in some cases fairly recently you know got access to like media like satellite television and things like that and uh, and the way into the ways how they get addicted to those those things that's surely surely one one aspect I think in many cases that actually still happens in a situation where you just encounter one medium and maybe there's a certain kind of a, like a idea about exclusion you get addicted to that so you exclude certain other activities and things but I think that surely the surely the most interesting example that we we have about this I think I'm, maybe you think about that as well is definitely this uh, Korean South Korean addiction to online gaming so that is a very interesting issue because the South Korea is the most wired country in the world in terms of high-speed connections high-speed networks and uh, also I mean that very saturated by computers and things like that so First of all, many people could use the computer and the high-speed connections from the home, but still it seems to have become the pattern that these people play these online games rather in these game centers. And I think it's not just because they have to, but because they want to. They want to play it in these, these centers. And uh, I think that we are also seeing this changing attitude by the Korean government, so that originally they were really kind of almost like endorsing, so like pushing this idea, you know, that South Korea is the most advanced country, you know, in the, in the world in that sense. But, but very quickly it has turned into this concern now that there's more research that has been done that actually massive numbers of course, young Korean people, in many cases young people, have really, really got addicted to this thing. And I, I read, recently read an article which uh, was about these measures that that the uh, Korean government is planning to take somehow to sort of like somehow control this thing. There's this age issue, of course, like a, 
like a defining age. I don't think this is has anything to do with politics. You know, really, it's it's really about, in in the case of South Korea, some as something something else. But surely, I mean that if we go to China, so then the politics, uh, political issues, <laughs> become a very very important uh, ingredient in this old old discussion. I understand that in China also. I mean, some southern part of China, at least somewhere. This, this online gaming has has become, for instance, a very big issue. But but I, I don't know how they analyze the values and things like that. So that so I'm not uh, a specialist in this. But it's it's a definitely it's a, one of the most interesting issues happening right now anywhere in the world, which which forces us to look at the the discourses around this issue of a, attention in the context of media. So. I have a few articles about this, uh, but um, I don't remember exactly what kind of measures are taken. I think it's a, it's an open situation because it's happening just right now. But that's a, my it's an open answer to your very important and big interesting question. I was just interested in the uh, this idea of topos or top topo. Yeah. Um, it seems to me as though, it, because you say it repeats itself, is there any way that you think we could break the topos? Do, do you think it's instilled in like human, in human nature, yeah. like the fact that it, mm. it's our desires, you know, uh, this yeah. guy being comfortable or asking? My <coughs> my immediate answer to this. Um, this this question is is actually uh, in a way sounds like an old school answer, like a sixties, like a radical avant-garde position. But I mean, I would say become conscious of what the topos and break it. So surely, I think that there are ways of working against this topoi. Surely, but I mean, the, we first have to become aware of the. So, like I said, the life of this topo, the functioning, what, what is in topos. But I think that in, in some sense I see it often happening, let's say, on the, on the field of like radical art practices, you know, in the like situationism, you know, like how situationism start, started identifying all kinds of signs from the built and social environment and sort of like turning them against each other, sort of like manipulating these things. Surely, I think that in some sense what they were doing, even though they wouldn't have used this word topos or something like that, it was something like that, so like becoming... So the situationists uh, were really concerned about this heightened in awareness of, of the environment. You know, like we, we, our relationship... Okay, I'm just not going to repeat all these arguments, but, but like... Uh, Guy Debord says so that so that our relationship in a in a condition of like uh, the society of the spectacle leads to a certain kind of alienation, you know, because if everything is turned into a spectacle, we we may lose this, you know, relationship kind of notion idea of, of reality. So in in some sense, you know, the situationists really wanted to kind of renew this consciousness, this awareness, you know, and in the end break through that. Society of the spectacle break through the screen, which is a, is a topos itself. You know, if I say break through the screen, it's an idea that's been repeated for hundreds and maybe for thousands of years. Break through the mirror, do, all do that you kind think of things. Do you think it could work the opposite way? Like like the situationists were very they were in the context of of the modern world. You know, they they saw these what they saw I think as problems. Could it work the opposite way? Like when you when you talked about the third world, how they haven't got this, they might not have the same knowledge or the same mm. history as 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 we do in the Western world. Could they be broke that way by the technology being introduced mm. there and the the background not being as in in depth? As so are you are you talking about like this uh, this famous um, African design based on recycling? You know kind of like, a, so like a beer cans and things like that. So doing it something active, turning it into active cultural production and things like that. I don't know if I can uh, find an example to, about this from the field of like media culture really. I think that in, um, 
I saw recently some somewhere some festival some so like African video produ production like a, some local TV network somewhere I don't know, maybe Ni Nigeria uh, where they are actually doing so what what used to be called scratch video they are taking these sort of like Western soap operas and things and they are actually changing them and uh, kind of changing the rhythm and whatever and those supposed to be very popular among certain people. It's a kind of a way of rapping with this Western cultural production and things like that. I mean, definitely they wouldn't think about those as, that they are sort of like kind of dealing with certain kind of topoi and things like that. But I mean, that that is something that seems to be leading back to sort of like, hmm, maybe sort of like way of, ways of manipulating material culture rather than manipulating discourses about that. So I think that the, if you think about the situationists in the West, they were very sort of like, in a, in a way, discourse oriented, so that they were very semiotically oriented as well. They wanted to read, you know, the, read the surroundings, but also think about the meanings around and all those things. But, but if we think about what's happening in the third world, I mean, the, there's a word for that, bricolage, or the, from the Claude Lévi-Strauss, the structural anthropologist, means, means the science of the concrete take concrete things, change them, put them together, and form messages. And that's, I mean, the Africans are doing that so that using whatever they have and turning them into something else. So maybe, maybe, the, maybe it is a way of working somehow uh, against these, these, these topoi. But not necessarily, I mean, that, that we know that there's a complex issue, that there's also a lot of, you know, idolization, you know, like, adoration of the Western product and things like that. So that it's, it's not so simple. It doesn't, it's not like a simply re reversing something, but it's also somehow kind of like uh, imitating, imitating certain parts of this, this, this Western issue. And this also leads interesting to the field of design, I think, which, which we have to consider. But it's a very good question. It's, I think it's, it's, it's highly relevant to ask that, that kind of I don't know if this is an answer, but I don't have a I don't have a kind of absolutely simple clear answer to such a to this issue. Could it be a, a cultural issue? In other words, if you do media archaeology in Japan or in Africa, you would actually get a completely different topoi. I think so. Um, I mean, actually, so so in other words, this is one particular way of interpreting, as is always true for all historical yes. overviews, right? Sure. I mean, that, that's the, that's, yeah, that's the point. And, uh, and I'm, surely, I mean, that these examples that I, I deal with come from the Western tradition, where, but, if we want to deal with these issues uh, in a sort of like from a wider perspective, let's say look at the uh, Japanese context, it, it is true that the, uh, this kind of way doesn't necessarily work as such. You know, you have to modify that. And we are actually trying to, um, we are trying, surely. And also this guy, you, you know that many countries don't have this, this notion of history itself. Notion, notion of history is, is uh, culture specific. You know, it's he, there are many, many, many cultures that don't have this kind of re written record. So it's more like more like uh, based on oral traditions, not, not wrote, written down at some point. And and the, maybe the best example of all would be the dream time in the among the Australian Aborigines, which is a highly sophisticated way of I mean, conceiving the world and the history, history uh, developed for thousands of years, and it doesn't absolutely match at all. You know, the kind of the Australian, ver Western version of that. There's a really interesting book that that I I'm very much much inspired by. I always uh, that I mentioned Eric Michaels, the called Bad Ab Original Art. This Michaels was a great guy. Unfortunately, he died very young. He had AIDS. He was an American anthropologist that was actually doing his research among the aborigines in Australia. And uh, he was, um, 
he was uh, researching um, the ways how they um, how they adopted the technology sometimes given by the Australian government and turned it into their own sort of like uh, kind of like a vehicle for ex expressing ideas about this dream time. They're kind of their own way of looking at the world, but also about this incredible political, political and ideological problems that led from. I mean, that um, you know this this thing led to you know just having this Western technology when it was in totally different, total contradiction to many values about their like their attitudes about property. The attitudes about secrecy, the attitudes about like uh, social relationships and things. So we really have to be very, and that is a good book about. Uh, I mean, if you want to get aware of the problems of applying a Western scientific uh, scholarly apparatus into reading something like that, and surely I mean that if we start applying these ideas to India or or China, so we we absolutely have to really kind of critically uh, question this concept and notion. By the way, so I'm hoping to take a step towards that direction uh, in the sense that I have a, actually a very, very, very early preliminary plan with, an, um, with a professor from Singapore who's actually now in the States, so with Gunalan to uh, see if we can actually develop some kind of a research, very loose research project, which would actually I try to identify researchers from these non-Western countries who would be interested in discussing this, this idea. We just had this meeting about this. Maybe it could lead to a book later, because such a book doesn't exist. Looking at media culture and, and its, this, its, its history from a sort of like more global angle bypassing this Western dominant view. But that is, it will take some time, you know, if that will start working, because we don't, we have to identify these people first and see if there are people who share any of this interest, actually. But we, would, we just had this meeting about this last week. Well, I'm afraid we ran out of time. These guys have a class with Christian next, and this discussion will obviously be continued for the next couple of years because you'll yeah. be working closely with RK. Yeah, you will have um, plenty of opportunities plenty to, of take it, to take it, take take it deeper because I'm, I'm <laughs> thinking of, I'm not uh, just presenting just my ideas, for instance, in that theory seminar, but, but we will be also reading work by, by other interesting, uh, other Friedrich Kittler and others, try to understand how how other cultural theorists and historians are kind of like looking at these issues and uh, and uh, switching between the present and the and the past in in those things as well. So I think that there's an opportunity to deepen this discussion and uh, and I, I always hope that also somehow applying it to these artistic and design practices because like you mentioned you mentioned the Delirian Scofidius. Uh, contributions and there are others too like doing it so I think there are many many f interesting and fresh and unexplored ways of like somehow bridging these these interests thank so, you Arky. all right thank you